Yeah, we have you for the last time, I think, here before you yes. run to, to Poland or Finland or whatever. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a slight change in the title, which means not a hegemony theoretical perspective, but on hegemony and social human rights. Um, what I wanted to show, somebody asked me if it's in uh, English, the presentation, or in German. It's in Latin, it's in Nova Fert Animus Mutatas Dicere Formas Corpora. Uh, which is from Ovid, uh, from Ovid uh, the metamorphosis, and means I intend to speak of forms changed into new entities. So human rights is a matter, I was wondering if it's really a matter for the contemporary uh, talk here, uh, but what th there is a permanent and ongoing tension, uh, which is, uh, I take it from two, two other quotes, as long as something is, it is not what it will have been. Meaning when they decided on the Uni uh, uh, Universal Declaration, this was a completely different time. They thought they would speak for the eternity, but this is the problem. They did, because the world changed, and this means that we have to think, reconsider this question as well. The next question, uh, this was actually by uh, Martin Walzer, uh, Walzer. Uh, from an interview, same Martin Walzer from a uh, uh, novel, wouldn't it be nice when everything between parents and children is well ordered without the need of formulating anything of it? Those are the most obliging contracts which are valid without being concluded formally. And this is, I think, the fundamental tension we have when it comes to law and when it comes then especially at a, uh, to, to a universal law, universal declaration of universal rights, meaning a general, very general um, uh, background and definition of a framework. It's my last lecture here, at least for some time. Don't know, uh, I came a couple of times back to the MPI, uh, and it's the third uh, lecture during the, throughout the year. Uh, which I spent here. So why? Sine ira et uh, studio. That was another Latin. I couldn't stop this uh, from Tacitus. Uh, meaning there shouldn't be any interest. It should be just about studying in a neutral way. Uh, it should be. It is. At the same time, one of the reasons uh, for having proposed this proposal today was that I was last week in Poland, uh, which was kind of shocking to experience what we all know. Nationalism, uh, control, censorship, and the like, where the Polish prime minister or vice prime minister, I don't know, said values, and talking about universal declaration of human rights, is very much talking about human uh, values. Values are interests. There is no difference between them. His Hungarian colleague said, yes, I absolutely agree, and our interests are Christian values. So I thought, right, we have had this in the 1930s, when there was as well, in a way, the same pattern. Our interests, Jews don't count, and they had been, you know, in the lucky case, they had been ending uh, in exile. So what is going on today with human rights and how can we try to define it um, as well in terms of looking at reality and realities today in a change framework, meaning today we have a higher level of globalization. And this is one of the problems I see that our methodology in social science and this is wherever you go. I'm an uh, economist by, uh, by, uh, by profession uh, and sociologist. Wherever we go, we have four pillars or four strands of methodology. Individualism, methodological individualism, me uh, methodological nationalism, it's the nation state. Uh, solutionism, we have to find a solution for a single problem. And the next is presentism, we have to find it now. 
This is a strange, weird force that we have to find answers for today, now, for the nation state, taking us as individuals as point of departure. Now, in social science, we have, and I can only briefly uh, look at this, a typical division into different dichotomies uh, or uh, into different ideas of where the world runs. Maine was especially, should be known uh, to you, uh, saying from status to contract. But there was a, an interim phase of from status to contractualized status and then, uh, then to contract, to pure contract. Uh, others calling Clark, John Forestier, uh, three sectors. Primary sector is agriculture, then to today actually to more, uh, where we have information technology and this as a separate sector. Uh, but we have a shift of economic activities and focus. Uh, industrialization, Kondratiev, uh, my other topic, digitalization, um, Rostov, the, the, the kind of natural development of societies, which was the natural development, and there I come to this uh, core point of the methodology of human rights, which I see at least behind human rights, it is about a certain economic idea of, I wouldn't say a market society, but a commodity producing society where everybody has to fit into this. Everybody means as individual, I think it's uh, Article 23 uh, of the Human Rights Declaration, uh, everybody has to fit into the system via employment and all rights are derived from this status. The same for nation states, there you have, look at Rostov, he said it explicitly, you all will be at some stage developed, a developed capitalist nation state. It doesn't work out, that's another question. But at least this is the idea. And then we, are, uh, we, we all have the, the, the rights, the full rights. Can go on endlessly, uh, Stein Rokan, uh, Arendt. Arendt is especially important, labor, work and action. Labor in terms of this is producing the foodstuff, if you want. Work producing and, and daily reproduction. Work basically produce the table on which we put the, the, the food, uh, meaning producing some goods and action is immediate interaction with others. So, Vazak Karel Vazak came up with these three generations of human rights, and I uh, would have liked to show this really in the original, because in the wording, uh, it's, it's in many cases you find this reference, uh, but it's poor, pure, uh, in a poor way uh, replicated, uh, uh, repeated. The first generation concerns negative rights in the sense that their respect requires that the state do nothing to interfere with individual liberties and correspond roughly to the civil and political rights. The second generation, on the other hand, requires positive action by the state to be implemented as is the case with most social, economic and cultural rights. And the third one is the international community is now embarking upon a third generation of human rights, which may be called rights of solidarity. What we all have, always have, is the conflict protecting people on the one hand against the state. This was the basic uh, idea behind the, the Universal Declaration. And at the same time, protecting or regulating uh, setting the framework for the interaction of people, protecting people against people in the framework of the nation state. This is setting the framework then where we have to think, that's my opinion, about a fourth generation. What is now where we have a higher, much higher level of socialization and of globalization what is now required to think about human rights. And there we have another fundamental problem 
of um, law, we are dealing with individuals and we are dealing with larger entities, the states especially. There is a tension. Methodolo methodological individualism says there is none because we are all individuals and that's it. But we permanently see we are not pure individuals. We are living in societies and we are depending on societies. We are depending on acting, interacting with others. And this is of course something where we have a higher level of interaction today which is not least uh, linked to digitization, freedom of information, the right to access information and all this. Some people say this is the candidate, candidate for a fourth uh, generation of human rights. I would not agree with that and I would say what we actually need is working on this tension between um, working on this tension between individuals and larger entities. And the larger entities do exist in different ways. We have Christian faiths, we have Muslims, we have Buddhism, we have whatsoever. And we have uh, people who don't believe in anything. Uh, how can we accept them and say at the same time there is no reason for accepting it because it's universal anyway. So it applies for everybody. There is a certain tension I see permanently and this is what I see currently as a major problem in law, in politics and in economics. We have this major shift back to self-regulation if you want. Governance. My friend Jérôme Vignon in the European Commission came up with this. It's about governance. It's not about government, it's not about clear structures, but it is about governance where everybody can interact. Who is everybody? That's the strongest. Of course, because the weak don't, and this is exactly the problem, the weak don't have a voice. It is at least difficult to give them a voice. And this was my experience uh, a shocking experience from Poland where I saw these nationalists. Yes, let's do it. It's our interest. This is the value. Meaning university, universal rights are getting stuck in this tension of who is able, who is uh, allowed to define universal character. Which means we have more and more, that's the paradox, we have more and more legal provision because everybody has, in, in, in law especially, everything has to put into a binary code. Right, not right. Lawful, not lawful. There is no, or it's difficult to find a space in between. If there is a gap, we have another law. Luhmann, sociology of law, worked on this. Get the problems of law solved by new laws. So we have a bulk of uh, information of law, of legislation, uh, where we lose the uh, overview. And then we have the turn that I mentioned before. Not having law or having law and giving it away. I was recently finalizing the report for Ireland, Republic of Ireland's uh, recent re development in social law. Um, they are doing things without, it's not unlawful, but without any proper legal regulation, without, no, uh, without proper act, which I thought is a little bit strange. In the UK we have the same apparently. And another trend is we give things away to the constitutional courts or something else. So it's the interpretation of law is getting more and more um, important. And then we have in parallel, and this is really more throwing out ideas and, and where, where I'm working on, 
uh, or worked on a little bit. But, but uh, to think about where are we going? We have in parallel uh, things of datafication uh, in law, including that we put the data into the computer and the, 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 the computer decides what is right and what is not right. Uh, we have a kind of extreme individualization but I came across recently something stunning. Uh, you all saw it. Uh, I don't know if you engaged in it. There is the, the public space is now occupied about you. And I thought, what, what is this about? Didn't make any sense. You see it around here on the pavement. About you is a company, online company, selling uh, clothes. This is occupation of public spaces. If I do graffiti on the streets, I will leave, leave, leave even more, uh, e even earlier than I do anyway, because then I end up in prison or in court or wherever. Isn't it weird? And it's going on hand in hand, and it is the, cl the, the claim we have. We want to have the right as individuals and they have nice uh, slogans there. Uh, Apple stores, another thing, this individualization in the social space and occupying social spaces. Um, education is entertainment and issueified business. And this was this documentation I saw in there. I, I, I'm nearly to the end. Uh, I saw a documentation which shocked me. I had been before coming here teaching uh, in, in China. Uh, and international, it was a joint venture. Uh, and this documentation showed Concine Era Studio. It showed where my students ended in an international machinery, kind of forcing them to buy education it is not about education, it is about high-ranking universities where there is more as you pay, as more as you get. Uh, to see this was really shocking for me. And it is not about China, you find this wherever. Uh, Stanford, uh, by the way, is dropping, so don't apply there anymore uh, in the ranking. But, but this is a funny thing that we are kind of forced into this area. And there you come to the global dimension as well, that well, there is this quali uh, qualification of uh, advanced, uh, advanced societies, emerging societies, and uh, developing societies. But they are all pushed into this direction. Human rights are redefined as you have the right to take part in international business. I think it is an interesting tension, at least, where law, as well as social law, human rights law, has to work on. And I think it is as well about the question of where to, to define and how to define, how to deal with borders. I suggest we cannot do it with the methodology I mentioned. I would say globalism, a methodological globalism, instead of nationalism, Methodolog methodological collectivism, non spherism, and sustainability. Uh, sustainability. Uh, that, that these, the frames, are changed. That we don't try to do something with the old frames, reinterpret the world a little bit more the collectivity of nation states, but that we start from another end. And I end here without coming to a conclusion. Thank you. as you have in the um, 
Universal Declaration of Human Rights, rights also positive obligations, but the focus was on the negative obligations. So the discussion was on the negative obligations. But in the 1966 um, um, international conventions, there you have the focus on the um, on the implementation of positive obligations because they you have in, in the Articles 2 um, set out that states need to work towards an implementation of the human rights framework. So I think the shift is in the discussion and not in the legal text. Um, and I think the same is true for, for what you said um, on the fourth generation. So the, the question is, what do we need? And is law really a binary code? And that's my question to you. Is that what you expect of law? Then you get away from legal theory that basically says, I need a general rule that can solve individual cases to what we experience now, and there I agree with you, is that we expect that we find directly in the text of the law a solution that is done in the individual case. And I think it's a misunderstanding of law that law could solve any individual case. You will always have these gray zones between right and not right. And we are less and less able um, to support this tension, which is why so many people are asking for, but I need a law that says, that speaks to my individual case. But I think that's not law. Law should give you a general rule, and then you need to understand what the law says, and then you can interpret. And what we do at the moment is just to read the text and to think that there, there is the solution. But law can never be directly applicable to a social reality, because that's not what law is made for. Law is made for to give a general rule, to give a context. And that is what I think is at the moment in danger that the idea of law is a very individual idea and not a global one. And do you think law should be binary or not? That, that's my question. I don't know, shall I answer immediately or do? No, maybe you can talk before then I have a comment on this one. Whether the three generations, one can accept them or not, uh, that was this, this it's a main, discussion or mainstream proposal by Vazak uh, coming up with we have three generations. Uh, I would agree, I, I would say actually we, we don't have, or, or this, this concept of generations, especially in this case, is not really suitable. And this was one of the reasons for, for at least mentioning some of these uh, issues of, of main from st status to contract. I added from status to uh, contractualized status, at least you have some something between. The, the three, um, uh, three sector model is questionable as well, uh, especially when you uh, reach out to the global stage. Now, I think, well, I'm, I'm suffering from my uh, training having been student um, and then colleague from Niklas Luhmann. Um, yes, it is binary. And I think it law, and, and, and this supports you in a way, law can only be binary. You cannot have a little bit right. And this is the question how far uh, reaches law. And this is, I think, where, where we have to go on the global level. Uh, where we have exactly this problem of we try to stay in this framework and find another binary solution where the, the previous one didn't work out. The contradicting answer is, and this is I think very dangerous, no it doesn't work, so skip this, have general values, and then you have the interests, which I think is, is hugely dangerous if we give the entire, now I'm not qualified to speak as lawyer, but uh, or, or as a legal scholar, but if we give it away to say, no, we do the little bit of general values, 
and we leave it to the rest to sort it out then to, 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 to think about what does it mean in concrete terms. I think this is hugely dangerous because there is this emerging uh, um, voluntarist, particularist ambiguity uh, as an answer where we have, and this is a kind of permanent struggle for, for me, uh, as well in economics, uh, where you have kind of strict rules and where it is not about values. And we have to define exactly where does it, where, where does the one end and the other begin. Instead of redefining or trying to re redefine um, the entire uh, thing then as value-based. Okay, you have values, and then you come, and, and this was my experience uh, in, in Ireland teaching social policy, it's all about values. No, it's not all about values, there are rights. And I cannot say, as Tony Blair did in the neighboring, on the neighboring island, it's all about values, we'll empower you, and this means you go back to work. I was just looking at that time at the, the English discussion and the RME in, in France, where the original RME was quite of open in terms of supporting people. And I think it's not about values. They, they play a role, but then it comes to definition in economics, in law, in all these things, where you have to say, and this is something I follow up. I have criteria where I can clearly say, yes, you have the right. And it's not, I have the right to interpret what this is. Because then you end up always with a stronger one, um, stronger states, stronger individuals, uh, stronger communities who decide, yeah, this is our interest, this is general value, and the rest forget it. I, I have problems, I, I see your, your point. I, I have problems in, in going one or the other day, way, and this is, in a way, my, my idea of a fourth generation to, to redefine the standard. To, to say it's not the nation state. Even what, what's his name, Schäuble says, the nation state is gone. And then he claims German rights. <laughs> um, do, you, do, can I have to you, do, um, do you want to make that paper? Or is it a paper already? It, it is a preparation for a book in uh, Paul Grave, I think, wanted me to write it. Or, or some editing people. If that's the case, you might want to look at the... Hmm? Um, you might want to look at the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights on Article 8 ECHR, on the right to private life. Um, there, there's always in the jurisprudence on the justification side a weighing of interest. The interest of the individual and the interest of the state that might support your argument that we need to move onwards from the interest-based interpretation of human rights. This, um, that, that would be probably a good example where it is really dangerous because no. um, then the interest of the state can be defined by the state and human rights are by that defined by the state and not on a global level anymore. Well, just two points of, first I think, um, I, I agree with you that uh, the law is a binary code, and I think the, this comes from this prohibition of the non-liquid, so the judge can never say I do not decide, and he must decide somehow. So either you have the right to expansion or not, either uh, you have uh, the right to take 30 days of holidays or not, you, you must be deciding one way or the other. There is no thing such as you sort of have the right to this, Pensions, that's this and this and that. Uh, the, the second point that you want <laughs> actually just mention now, it was, uh, um, I will remember in a second. Uh, uh, we're talking here about uh, uh, the very, uh, very first question of the theory of law. And uh, I would like to, to, to call two names. It's Dworkin and Alexi and the theory of laws. So we got rules and we got principles. And rules are binary in this context. So I may or may I not. 
And on the other hand, first of all, in the constitution law and in the, in the international law, we have the principles, and they are open. They have to be open, because we just can't define the social justice. What will it mean? And uh, this is, uh, as I said, the very first question of the theory of law. Is it binary or not? In, in the sin, uh, um, uh, it's, uh, there are rules or principles or both, and we have to handle them, deal with them. And uh, but uh, at the end, we have the law in action, and as you said, we have to find an answer. When I come to the attorney, when I come to the court, then we have to solution the single case, and uh, the jurisprudential can just say, the set is, I don't know. So we can just discuss, we can say you get right to this uh, work agreement, to the uh, pension or something like that. And although we get many open principles in law, not only on the highest level, but also in the general um, acts of law. And it has to be so because we have, as you said, many values behind the law. And these values are mostly not in the one direction going, as I would understand. As there are values that did not could be together realized. And therefore, the principles have to be valued and they have to be cross-checked through the constitutional courts and so on. That's the work of the highest courts and that's the, that's the, the first question of theory of law. The relationship between rules and principles. The closed, binary, and they're open just from the nature of the principle. Thank you. Do, do you want? No, I remember the second thing you wanted okay. to say, but, but it's but not related to this talk. Mm. So I could also have a comment on that, because I don't think it's true that the judge cannot say, I don't decide, because if you look at especially labor law, there's always a mediation and there's always looking for a compromise and the judge will only rule if the parties are not able to find the compromise. And, and you see such development also in administrative law, which I think is highly unproblematic, because if you start in the social security system to say like, okay, if you, I will give you 10 euros more if I don't have to write, write a judgment um, and, and to find a compromise like that, I, I see the problem. But I think it is not so that law is always clear. And, and, no, that, no, and, no, and no, that, that the decision is always clear. We so that make a decision. Yeah, but, but I think the, the, lead, the jurisprudence goes more in the way that mediation is kind of done before a decision is given. And mediation to well, I, I don't have my, my Ovid with me. Uh, Ovid, at the end, it was the last sentence, actually, he said, everything can be changed. Really, everything, including he reforms to Jupiter and, and Rome, but not my, poets, uh, my, my, my writing. Uh, last sentence uh, of, of Ovid. This is, I, I think, the, the, the problem or the challenge as well, where do we define, where and how do we define this, this closeness and openness? And my plea, in a way, and this kind of justifies to speak of a fourth generation, if you want, um, where I don't think this is an ideal terminology, but we have now, being economists, this, this changed economy. We have, in general, in general, a shift from labor. We don't have to look that we get enough to eat now by our labor. We go into the shops and we have increasingly what Hannah Arendt would call action, interaction. We produce relationships consciously. We always did it, but now we, we, we do it consciously. This is and should be a right, or a question for human rights, to define people have a, a right 
to define, to control their relationships. It is not just enough to give them labor, enough labor or enough work, but to give them spaces, and this is why I refer to about you. They can do it, I cannot do it, let alone people in other countries can do it in, in the so-called emerging countries or whatever. Oh, this is, I think, a, a major problem in, in rethinking as well rights. We have increasingly the, the use of spaces. And there I think it's not just about um, control of, of data uh, production and data access and these things, they play a role. But with this, we have an, a new step, new level of uh, socialization. And then we come, of course, to this point, uh, where, where is the border? Who is part of it? Who can join the networks, uh, solidarity, and, and, and? Uh, b because these borders do exist even between an Apple computer and uh, uh, another computer, there's a technical stupid thing still going on. But, but we have borders, we have language borders. So we cannot simply ignore them. So what, how do we define it? And language borders don't play a role if I'm in a small community where everybody speaks the same language. As soon as somebody comes and has it as a second language, there is a Challenge. As soon as we depend in international trade or whatsoever on having a common language, I'm waiting for this day when the Chinese say this is Chinese now. It's not Spanish. Spanish, is the, Spanish and English are the most spoken languages, uh, apparently, and Chinese. But Spanish didn't manage to get a world language, English did, and the Chinese, we would be all stuck. Would the, 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 the global economy would collapse for 20 years. If they would, I say it now over the top, over the point, if they would claim their rights, we are the strongest language, so adapt to us. And this is as well, we are the strong, in, in some way, we, United States especially, are the strongest economy, and there we see the change actually. There are, I, I think this is a linked question of, of uh, human rights as well, that the, that the United States and uh, uh, Europe lo lose power, lose part of their power, part of their control. And this is why actually uh, we don't have an end of history, but we have a new start. And then you have other regions, of course, they, they try to, to gain and what's that. But where, where I think it's, it's about the, the standards, not, not just get more binary. Yeah, I think if we're out of time, I can discuss this.